You're listening to the Youth Creek Podcast on KHZ Network. Find us on Facebook at Decibel UNG Radio and find us on Twitter at Decibel UNG. If you like this episode, please leave a like and comment on our iTunes page at KHZ Network. And now for the podcast. The world we live in is not what it seems. There are evil forces lurking beneath the surface. Criminals. Gotta love drugs. Look at me, I'm a hooker or something. Maniacs and the insane. A plan so sinister is developing, not even the law can neutralize it. I would junkie. But there is one man. Yo, 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 what the fuck is that? Who will stand up and bring justice down on those who deserve it. Motherfucker! You're dying and I don't give a fuck. In fact, I'm happy about it. But so. when you live on the edge... Oh, I'm gonna blow All right. my over the gun. Anything can happen. Look at me, I'm a big fucking idiot. My name is... Podcast, I am here with Greg Deliso, is that correct? Very, very close, man. Thank you. It's Greg Deliso, but most people say Delicio. They add an extra I, and you did not, so I give you a lot of uh, props and kudos for that, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, Greg Deliso. Hello, and thank you very much for having me. And today, listeners, we are going to be interviewing Greg on his new movie, Hectic Knife, uh, from Trauma Films. And so, Greg, um, I'm going to just start by asking you, how did you get your start in the film business and what's your background in filmmaking? Well, uh, I, I got bitten by the movie bug, as they say, when I was just six years old, I saw Jurassic Park in the theater. Um, and I, you know, I saw it like three or four more times after that as a kid, I was just, uh, I'm a Spielberg kid, like at heart, that's, he was my first big influence. And um, so when I was six years old, I was already like thinking about movies all the time. And I started to take it more seriously when I was probably in my early, early teens. I started reading about um, a lot like 70s uh, independent movies like and, uh, you know, filmmakers like Kubrick and and Scorsese and Woody Allen. And and, um, I got really interested in that stuff. And then um, I got really serious about it when I was in my mid teens. I got my first camera. I got you know, I started editing um, at home and um, this was around 2000 or so. So I started, I got very lucky because obviously the digital age was, was coming up. And so I was able to um, shoot and edit video right in my parents' basement there for, for pretty cheap. Um, so I started on Adobe Premiere way back when it was the original Premiere oh, editing wow. system way back in 2000. And um, I learned on that and I start. I switched over to Final Cut Pro uh, actually in high school when I was 17 in 2003. And uh, I've been cutting ever since. And I, I think I, so then I moved to New York City uh, right after high school and I was, seven, I was 17 years old. I graduated and then um, in that fall, right before I turned 18, I moved out to New York and I went to the New York Film Academy. And um, that's a year long directing program. Uh, back when I went there, it, the tuition was about 24K. Now it's probably like close to 40 because I mean, the, the way it just keeps going up and everything's crazy, but it was good. I got a lot out of it. It was, uh, they had, you know, a lot of gear. They, they was really hands-on. We were shooting and cutting all the time and really meeting people. And I, I made some great friends that I'm still friends with today. Um, but, uh, yeah, I kind of, I started interning when I was still in school and I got my first paying gig, uh, out in New York when I was 18 and I started freelancing and, um, I'm proud to say that I'm now, I just turned 31 a couple months ago and I've never had, uh, a real job. I've never done any job outside of the movie business. Uh, I, the only things, the only ways I've ever gotten paid in my life were for either PAing on a commercial or directing something or a music video or cutting or whatever. So I'm proud of that. Um, never had the nine to five, never went to college, never had a backup plan. Um, and uh, just been kind of, you know, I lived as a starving artist from about 17 to uh, 25 or so. And I finally started making some, some decent money at the craft. 
And um, I'm back here in Detroit now where I live. I've I've, I've grew up in Detroit, you know, the suburbs of Detroit. And uh, I'm back here now. I've been here for a few years and I got married and I have a house and you can see behind me. Well, you won't see on the podcast, but behind me uh, is my big studio and all that stuff. So I'm just out here making movies. And uh, yeah, I think that that kind of covers it. Um, I've been kind of doing it since I was a little kid, serious about it since teen years and making money since my late teens. And uh, now I'm about 30. So going back to filmmakers uh what very quickly what were your inf- who are your filmmakers that have influenced you the most sure yeah well so to start off i mean it was spielberg in the sense that spielberg was the first person that i understood by name as like a guy that made a movie and i was too young to even understand what that actually meant i mean i, I remember seeing jurassic park in the theater and simultaneously thinking well i really want to study dinosaurs and i also want to make movies whatever this movie thing is And so I got really into dinosaurs, but I remember the, um, if you remember that summer or whatever it was, uh, that fall. Yeah. 93. If you, so remember right after that, you know, the dress park was obviously the biggest thing ever. And they made a really amazing, um, hour long making of hosted by James Earl Jones that was on TV. And I would, I was like six years old and I was seeing Spielberg like directing this thing. And I like this movie and I was on set. I didn't know what he was like doing. It didn't really make sense, but, but, and I, I remember asking my grandpa, like, so did they have to film everything in order? And like, just, it came out that way. And he kind of explained and I, you know, but I was only like six, seven, eight years old. And um, so that was my real starting point. And then I'll say after that, um, Seinfeld and the Simpsons informed my comedy sort of brain and were like my other parents apart from my real parents because I'm an only child. My entire youth was spent obsessively uh, watching and basically studying every single episode of of Simpsons up until about, I mean, it's funny now there's more episodes of Simpsons that I haven't seen than that I have. It's been, I mean, I'm talking about the Simpsons from between when it started in 89 all the way up to like 2000 and like two maybe is when I watched it. And, um, but I was obsessive about that. And then, it, and then, but as far as directors specifically, um, the first big director that I got into aside from Spielberg was Kubrick. I was obsessive about him in uh, when I was around 12, 13, 14. And I, um, from him, I moved over to Scorsese um and but right now you know my favorite directors of all time i would say are the coen brothers uh robert zemeckis is probably number one um still spielberg is high up there but uh people like rob reiner amy heckerling penny marshall um guys like that uh but and then a lot of the sort of indie um 90s people i mean even uh kevin smith tarantino uh spike lee those were all big influences those were influences both and then i like i love their movies but i was also kind of I came of age, I was 10 years old when indie sort of broke again in the sense that the Oscars was uh, like Goodwill Hunting was like winning a big Oscar and all these little people. When Air Max were coming. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So it's what's actually really funny now is that with with Harvey Weinstein and all this awful, terrible stuff, yeah. I <laughs> my joke and it's t- t- terrible. But my joke is that, you know, as a kid, I could never explain to anybody now how much at 10 years old, it was my dream to have my career like ruined by Harvey Weinstein. Like, like that's the dream. It's like you grow up and you move to New York and then he like, you make this movie and then he like puts it on the shelf, like Shyamalan, like he did with Shyamalan. And then he's like, you know, stuck. And then he has to like, you have to break free and it's this whole thing. And then you eventually like work for him again and make this big Oscar movie. Like that's the dream. And then all of a sudden, you know, you find out he's like a horrible person and it's all a race, but no, I mean, Miramax informed a lot of my growing up. It was the, it was the film production company that made it seem like I could do something like that. And that's, was, that's really special for anyone trying to make movies. Right. And, you know, and Miramax and not to go on a tangent, but Miramax yeah. was, they were pioneers for, oh, yeah. you know, what they were. I mean, they were, they released uh clerks. They released, I mean, you mentioned Goodwill hunting. they, they did release uh, Shakespeare in Love, which has been controversial. Uh, but they, but then they do the English Patient. So I mean, they and you know, of course, all of Quentin Tarantino movies. So and they, they were pioneers of the nineties. Oh, absolutely, indie yeah. cinema. So mm-hmm. yeah, I and Robert Rodriguez as well. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but so movie, so moving to Hectic Knife. Where did this idea come from? Um, yeah. So I so uh, in. 
uh, sorry, so I have to cut out all these stupid ums and ahs here. Let me just think for a second. Uh, so I was li- back in the, around 2010, I was living with Peter Litvin. I, he's one of my best friends from high school. Um, you know, when I say we, we're, we're from Detroit, we're from the northern suburbs. We're not from eight mile. We're from uh, 22 mile. So it's it's a lot different where we're from. But um, so, yeah, we, uh, you know, kind of went to high school together and he was a musician. He always had his bands and was uh, making music and doing stuff. And I was a huge fan of his uh, bands. I thought he was a great musician. So we were always kind of friends at a distance and whatnot. And then I had moved to New York right after high school and he was kind of impressed by that. So he uh, moved out there a couple of years later and he happened to kind of be in touch with me because I was like the one that did that. So he kind of, we talked and he ended up moving to a neighborhood close to mine and um, he became friends with some of my other friends out uh, that were already out there. And it was kind of this, we were all kind of doing projects and stuff. And uh, I ended up living on his couch to save money so I could survive. I was like kind of going deeper in the rabbit hole of the starving artist by the time I was, um, you know, I had actually gotten a decent job as an editor at this uh, now defunct TV channel in New York um, called Imagination TV. I and mean, it doesn't even exist anymore, but it was just, I had a you know job there back when I was like 20. But by the time I was 23, I was still gigging around and not making a ton, you know, not making any more than a grand a month and trying to survive. And, and especially in New York City, that's almost impossible. So Pete offered me his couch and he um, set me up with a little retainer where it was basically I would make like any stupid art project that he wanted me to make and I couldn't like refuse it basically. And so we started making these short films and um, Hector Knife was just one of them. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of, as soon as we started our little deal, Pete, um, like went crazy and bought all these props and wigs and stuff. And so hectic knife just sort of was to like, he just naturally put the wig on and got the knives and wanted to kind of play around. And he started doing all these weird, um, like movements as if he was training and doing like fake fighting. And I was filming that and we just thought it was funny. I put it in the black and white. I, I kind of gave it this like weird 70s industrial like look to it and uh, the name popped into my head it all kind of just were these little kind of light bulb accident things and um next thing i know this is like 2010 next thing i know in a few months we're making a movie already like it was sort of at first i was like this is really funny let's do a web series and then we went to go shoot episode two and it was like 10 minutes long and i was like scrap that let's just make a movie and if, if you go on youtube you can actually see um there's uh there's all the short films that we did like leading up to that time and then also um the original first like quote unquote episode that hectic knife was if you go on the official hectic knife youtube channel it's called something like the first episode i don't know what it is but um you can see it's like hectic has a little scuffle in the hallway and there's even some cool stop motion i did with a robot in there a little toy robot so um nice. he's doing this fun stuff and and i think for me, the idea of what Hectic Knife really is, which to me is this sort of like modern superhero satire thing of, you know, kind of making fun of all movies at once, but nothing really is that specific of a parody, but just sort of like making fun of all movie tropes at the same time, whether it be Hollywood or indie, and then also kind of poking fun at the sort of overblown length of the superhero movies and how they're all like three hours long and insane. So it's kind of like that. I sort of, sort of understood that that was the direction it was going a month or two in. And then, you know, it took six years to make the movie, but that once I understood that it kind of, it all started shaping and working t- together and, and, and it became what it is now, movie, you know, the movie that it is. Awesome. So you went on to a little bit of the production process of the movie, but can mm-hmm. you explain like how many days did it actually take to shoot the movie and, and what were some of the resources that you had or what some of the challenges you had to overcome in making the movie? Sure. So um, it was definitely not a traditional production in the sense that Peter and I never sat down and wrote a script from page one to 90 and then went out and cast it and, you know, locked off 35 days and shot it and then, you know, locked off time to edit that. We did. We didn't do any of that. What we did instead was we would Pete was financing the first sort of uh, you know, the first, I'd say that the, you know, the like 80% of the first production where, which is when, you know, all the props and the casting and starting the shooting, he financed all that. And so that's how we're doing it. And because he financed it, we really worked, uh, one day a week sort of at a time, which means, um, if you know anything about, uh, Peter Jackson and his first movie, Bad Taste, he kind of shot it, it almost the exact same way that we did Hex Knife. And, and I'll actually 
I know it's a little bit of a tangent, but I hadn't seen Bad Taste and we were halfway through the Hector Knife production and I was, you know, 27 years old. I was or five or something like that. And I was lonely. This was before I met my wife. I was kind of just like depressed and lonely. And I was watching Bad Taste for the first time and I was thought it was cool. And I watched the commentary and they were saying how it's how they did the production. I was like, oh, my God, this is exactly how we did Hector Knife, because what happened was um, because it was all finance out of Pete's pocket, it would be on Wednesday, we would walk around our neighborhood and write. And we would say like, you know, Hector Knife, he should have like a silly, weird roommate. Like, shouldn't he? Like, well, what, what's the name? And we're just kind of bouncing these ideas off each other. And he would record it into his phone. And then he would go home that night and, and you know, to our place and he would type it up. And he, that would become the shooting script for the next Monday because Thursday, Friday, he would produce the shoot. And then Monday, we would shoot the scene with the actors. And we did that for about maybe 15 weeks consecutively. Um, so we shot the first 15 days of production were like that. And then it got disjointed because from that, I was able to make a rough cut. And that took me only like about two weeks. But that rough cut was put together in say, I don't know, 2013. Well, it didn't come out all the way until 16 because we, first of all, we did ADR for 80% of the movie. So we re-recorded all that, all the dialogue and all that stuff. And that took forever. It took, that took two or three years by itself. But we also, um, you know, I like to say when I first showed Pete the rough cut, I think it was an hour and 50 some minutes long. And from the time of showing him that first rough cut that, that I put together quickly till the end, you know, the end product is 82 minutes. So we essentially deleted out um, like almost, you know, cut that thing in half almost and then added back 10 new minutes that we shot after. So it was pretty remarkable from going from an hour and a half, you know, or an hour, 50 minutes and you cut out like 50 minutes all the way out of it or something like that, 40 minutes all the way out and then 10 back in. And then that's where you got the movie. So it was a very long uh, production. It was really like learning how to sort of make a movie and make it sort of um, dense enough and fast enough and paced the right way and, and enough jokes and everything to kind of sustain. And really it, that all took that amount of time to kind of learn like what it should be. And uh you know, all those things going into the process. But yeah, there were challenges all the way. I mean, at one point, you know, there, if you've seen the movie, there's a, a part where a little kid's head explodes. And um, that was a practical effect that we did that cost us $1,500, which at the time, that's like 10% of our budget, right? Yeah. Well, um, I basically learned in editing that we could have just done it essentially for like almost free and not had to have done all the work that we did. And it would have been exactly the same. So it's just lessons like that that you learn. I mean, it's like, you would say it, it's money wasted. Well, I mean, you know, it is, but it's a lesson learned and it's thankfully not, you know, killing us on the money. It's only $1,500. And I think our final budget for the movie, for the movie itself was about 20,000. And then including all of our promotion and, you know, trailers and the mini tour that we did and everything else, it's probably about 40,000 or 35,000 total. Um, and that's all out of my and Pete's pocket actually. So. Awesome. So how did you come? How did you come across Trauma Studios, and how did you, um, uh, and how did you get distribution from them, mm -hmm. particularly? Yeah. So, um, if you're living in New York, I, mean, I lived in New York for seven years, and uh, I would say that if you're in New York City and if you're working in the movie industry, which I was, it's almost impossible to not sort of encounter Lloyd in the sense that I had never met him in person. But by the time I was, you know, the first month I was in film school, I already had met someone that interned over at Troma and he had had Lloyd in his thesis. Um, and that was like 10 years ago. But then it's like, you know, I, I by the time I left New York City, I probably knew five people that I knew I could just call up and they'd give me his email address because they had worked with him in some way because he's that sort of accessible. The film community there is that small and they do enough work where people are always gigging on their projects and um, they're just accessible in general. It's like not to kind of skip ahead, but I now get people asking me like, Oh, how did you, you know, sign with trauma, like your question. And they, they might say, Oh, I made a movie. Like, how do I get distribution with trauma? How do I get them to, to see it? And I say like, look, you know, to be honest with you, I can't even help you. Like, because you just go on their website and it says right there, send us your film. Like, they're very open about it. They will watch it. I promise you, you send them something, they'll watch it. So 
that part of it, getting in touch with Lloyd was almost the easiest part. Um, Cause again, I mean, look, if you want Lloyd's email address, I'll fucking give it to you. He'd love for me to do that. It's not a big deal. Um, it's, you know, he's totally accessible. So it's not, that's, that's, that wasn't really a barrier. Basically the only barrier was that once I talked to him, it's kind of, I basically emailed him and I literally said, you know, Hey Lloyd, um, my name is Greg. I'm an independent filmmaker. Uh, I'm a big fan and I followed your advice. I made my own damn movie, which is a reference to the title of his book, make your own damn movie. And I said, my movie's got uh, blood babes and bagels. Um, and can I send you a screener? He emailed me back in about 40 minutes and he said, hectic knife sounds like the story of my life. Send it in. Uh, so I, I sent it right in and I, and literally that's the point when it's basically like, okay, so, uh, so basically once you send the movie off, you know, I've like, I've Lloyd has now responded and I've sent him off the email of the screener. It's basically just fingers crossed. I mean, my thing is I never really had much hope for the festival circuit with Hector Knife because it's SD. I shot it on tape on a Panasonic uh, DVX um, 100B, which at this point is a totally archaic camera. I, I'm very like super proud to say that I've had people ask me like, oh, did you shoot it on film? Because the look is really designed to mimic uh, like a Darren Aronofsky, like pie kind of a look, but it's on yeah. tape. So the thing is that uh, it, it's not to say that festivals won't take it, but I mean, if you imagine your movie that's on tape and they haven't seen it yet and they're, they have a whole giant stack and it also costs you 25 bucks or 50 bucks to submit in the first place and you got to do all this prep work so you might be out a 1500 or a grand easy on festivals and and only get into one or two so i was playing it cautious and i basically thought well let's try for distribution right off the bat and and because pete and i we're so like when I say small, it was such a small production, just the two of us, and we had no backing, we had no financing, we had no any any connection, anything else. It was just two guys making a movie. So our whole plan initially was to self distribute, and we basically assumed from knowing about Trauma that they will be open to us doing that on our own, but also letting us attach the Trauma logo to what we're doing, meaning like. Let's say it's 2014, Heck and Knife's not done yet. Peter and I had in our heads like, oh, it'd be a dream come true if we could like put on our own mini tour of this movie, hold screenings like across the country on, on our own dime at small bars and stuff. But wouldn't it be amazing if we could like use the Troma logo as like a, on the banner that so we can send a press release and it says like, oh, a new Troma movie in town. So it's not just like two guys, right? So that's the dream that we had from the beginning. And we're so proud that it came true almost immediately because like I said, it was the Lloyd was my first email and they responded back with a contract almost immediately. I and mean, it was about a week and they just basically, there was the only response was, yeah, like we want it right away. So I immediately got on the phone with Michael Hers, who is there, you know, it's uh, a trauma team presents, you know, a Lloyd Kaufman and Michael Hurst production. So Michael Hurst is like the business side of the whole deal. And uh, you know, uh, he yelled at me on the phone, like a classic uh, Michael Hurst experience. Like I'm sure we've all had in the indie business, but um, no, we, we struck a deal. It took like a few months to actually like, we had to get a, lawyer and like get notes on the contract. I mean, it's a seven page long contract and it's all got all kinds of stuff going on. You got to read every page with a magnifying glass, but we, um, we did it, you know, we signed it and, and, and almost exact, I would say exactly what our dream was has come true. I mean, we are, we, you know, we're able to release the movie on a VHS sort of on our own. We were able to print um, some of our own DVDs uh, before the Blu-ray came out. Um, you know, we, we've gotten some reviews and, you know, we've obviously been able to reach trauma fans directly. So I, I think the thing with Hector Knife is that, you know, there's no gratuity, there's no uh, nudity, there's no like sex scenes. There is not very, there's some raunchy dialogue but really it's all like language and silly or it's really just a comedy it's not like a horror movie or anything but um you know we regardless of all that we still fit into the trauma brand i mean like cannibal the musical was a huge influence on me and uh that is kind of what made me know about trauma and that to me it's i'm so honored to like be considered in the same you know, published catalog as, as that, as such a great movie as Cannibal. It's like a complete dream come true, like honor. So um, it really was, it's like a perfect fit for us. And it's really been a dream come true. And they're so like, you know, 
I mean, they're like 70 years old and they're still smart enough and cool enough and in touch enough to be like, yeah, you know, look, do your thing. You know, we think this is funny and we, we get it and it fits us and, you know, put our logo on it and do whatever you want, you know, go, go crazy. And they, they've let us do that. So, like I said, we were, we are able, you know, we had a mini tour. We played about five cities across the country in Denver and Fayetteville and, um, St. Louis and Chicago. And then we're going to be out on the coasts um, at some point in the next couple of years. So we'll be in LA and back in New York and stuff for some shows, but it's just, uh, you know, it's stuff that we're all allowed to do because of trauma. And I, I can't really say enough good things about them. It's been a dream. Awesome. Now yeah. going into the funny aspect of the movie, um, how did you guys come up with the idea? Cause they're in the film itself. There are jokes that, are uh, jokes that are about the jokes mm. in that there is this kind of and there in it people do like contextualize you know kind of how they you kind of make jokes about how low budget your movie is and how mm. long some of the joke scenes are uh particularly the bagel the whole bagel joke and right. uh, towards the the third act of the movie mm. uh so how where did that idea come from in terms of how did y'all decide on taking that risk with those jokes sure uh well to be as you know transparent as possible and just as honest as possible i mean the first obvious thing is that it's patchwork in the sense that we we don't have any money so and we're also like we're not making clerks where um the writing is so good and it's such a strong plot that like interweaves together so nicely that we can afford to just like um rely on that so we sort of knew it's like you know if we're gonna fill up 82 minutes of time we better sort of uh be a little bit self-aware about how it's just like white walls and, and all that stuff and so it's to me it go it even goes beyond some of the dialogue it's like we're purposely filming like blank white walls uh, to show you like this is a no budget thing and it's supposed to float on the jokes and i think you know, that's the tough thing. It's like there's definitely some people that are really turned off by that style of comedy because it's like if first of all, if you're not in on the joke, it's just like, well, what is this garbage? That's kind of the first layer. And then the second layer is kind of like, if you know, if you can even understand it and still hate it because it's basically just like, well, yeah, they didn't have any money and they're just basically like saying they don't making up for it. It's like, look, I, I fully understand that and I I can't defend it you know there's there's definitely been people on like imdb or amazon who have watched it you know from just coming across it and they're like yeah what is you know this is just like it cheap internet comedy and, and i can understand that my sort of it, you know for me i'm a, the biggest influence on hecky knife by far was uh david wayne and uh specifically what had american summer but really all of his catalog um and he's made uh, you know the 10 wanderlust um uh, obviously, what American Summer was his first feature, and then um, I'm forgetting him off the top of my head right now. But uh, but you know, he his so basically his style of comedy, um, and the very sort of uh, Andy Kaufman bizarre sort of meta comedy of of like Tom Green and Freddie Got Fingered and stuff like that. Those were the biggest influences on the movie as a whole. Um, and my basic idea, and, and this is actually like true, and I'm still amazed that this actually happened. And I actually, I'm so blown away by it that I actually used this quote in our artwork as a press quote, is that when I started the movie, I basically thought, you know, is it possible to combine airplane and eraser head? Like, can you make something that's bizarre and atmospheric and strange, but also has these like very sort of dumb banana peel broad slapstick like jokes that are like very wide and like silly and stuff and i to my um just like it made me misty like my utter amazement some person on imdb wrote this giant like multi-paragraph laudatory review and he literally said like look I, i've never done this before i don't normally like review movies on here but i came across this movie on some place like trauma now or amazon prime or something and at the bottom of his, he talks about how much he loves it. And then at the bottom, he says it felt like a racer had an airplane. And I was fucking blown. I'm sorry if I swore. Am I allowed to swear? No, you're but fine. You're I, fine. I, I was blown away that he actually was able to identify. Cause I didn't say that anywhere. I didn't say like, you know, I never put that in any kind of artwork or tagline or anything. And uh, I couldn't believe that somebody, you know, I know it's obviously like luck that he mentioned this exact same movies, but it, I'm just I'm blown away that that actually happened, and I, you know somewhere I was channeling 
something right because you know look hiding life is not anywhere near as good as airplane or where american summer or freddie got fingered or um you know the or racer had by any stretch but uh the fact that you know to me the ultimate pride that i have with hack knife is that you know it was a tiny no budget you know movie on stolen locations and you know we're using fucking a basketball court as india and all that stuff <laughs> but um but it's somehow the the idea that the ideas and the jokes um make it somehow real to people is just like blows my mind it's amazing to me because to me it's still just like pete and i fooling around and me trying to kind of learn on the fly how to like make a real movie because you know you remember before earlier in the when we were talking when i listed like my favorite directors there it's all kind of like spielberg and zemeckis and ivan reitman and darabont like these guys that make like these sort of big hollywood like put together productions and um you know, those are still the, that's still like a big dream that I sort of chase is being able to do that. But obviously you might look at Hex Knife and think like, well, you know, uh, like that style is that, you know, you can't really make a Hollywood thing where it's like some bizarre, you know, black and white four or three universe. And everybody's like talking to the camera and it doesn't make any sense. And everybody like says what they're about to do. But, um, you know, I looked, I just, to me, it's all about the craft and I, and it's the style. And like I said, you know, this was influenced by what I think are these brilliant comedies again, you know, like Spaceballs, another one, it's like a, a movie, a movie like Spaceballs to me, I'll say the number one influence for Hex Knife of all time is that shot in Spaceballs where they're, they watch the tape of the movie Spaceballs in the movie and they, they fast forward <laughs> to the moment because it's so meta. And I thinking, you know, that came out so long ago and it's this parody of Star Wars, but and it's this big Hollywood thing that everybody knows, like everyone knows Spaceballs. It's got real actors in it. Yet there's this bizarre scene where they're like watching the movie in the movie and they get up to now and they're like in the movie now and they turn it off. It's like those kind of things were it was kind of like Hector Knife was this experimental thing of like, is it actually possible to make an entire movie only on that premise? And so my thinking was, OK, well, we have like, you know, a superhero to latch on to. We have a villain. We have, you know, we can use these like movie tropes of like big DC and Marvel, you know, Batman movies of today, but it, maybe I can like boil that down to 80 minutes and then funnel it through this weird comedy vision and, and maybe that'll work. And again, it's not for everybody. I, I stress that, you know, there's plenty. I'm very proud of our reviews and our ratings on Rotten Tomatoes and everything, but we certainly get handfuls of these like really negative reviews. And sometimes it's a throwaway negative, but sometimes it's from a person that's like, Oh man, you know, that's the kind of person that I really wish we could have like captured because they probably do like good comedy, but they, they just see it as like cheap, nothing. So it's there, it, you know, I'm still working. I'm still trying to do my best and heck to knife is, you know, my first movie and I'm, I'm sort of proud of it as like the little movie that could, but um, yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your thing? Sorry. Does that answer your question? Oh, yes. So is it too early to ask for Hectic Knife 3, the search for Hectic Knife 2? <laughs> well, yeah, Hectic Knife 2 was te we teased Hectic Knife 2 for a while because right in the, in the excitement of finishing the first one, um, Pete and I, mostly Pete, uh, wrote a script for the second one. And so it's written. Um, but, uh, you know, we need to go do other things. We've been working on the same project for eight years now. We started in 10 where this blue is coming out and, not, and now it's 18 and um, you know, he's does his music. I got uh, you know other projects I've been, that I've been doing for 12 years now too, that I need to finish. So we're doing other stuff, but yes, I, I'm, you know, at some point, Hack Knife 2 will probably exist. And we've, we've always intended it to be sort of a trilogy, of course, anyway, because you know, why, why would you, if you're going to make Hack Knife, why would you not make it Indiana Jones with, you know, and I, I'm going to say three, I'm not even thinking of the other, you know, other stuff. I'm just saying it's like Star Wars, there were three, you know, Indiana Jones, there were three, Go or uh, Back to the Future, there were three. It's like, why not round it out? So that was always our plan. But, um, you know, we're just doing other stuff now. And hopefully there'll be a demand if, they, you know, obviously if the demand uh, keeps going and if people are asking about it and care about it, then we'll definitely jump on it sooner. So. Awesome. You yeah. you kind of did touch on it, but what are you working on next? Yeah. So um, 12 years ago when I was in New York and I just got the the DBX that I ended up shooting Hike and Nippon, um, the first project that I started was a documentary about music. It's a two and a half hour long um, project um, with complete with an intermission. I interviewed over 100 people across North America. I have um, musicians in it from, you know, Grammy winning platinum selling artists like Bela Fleck and 
Victor Wooten, Bill, you know, Bill Fleck and the Flecktones, members of uh, Dave Matthews Band, members of Danny Warhol's Prison of the United States of America, Sugar Hill Gang, um, Ari the Rugged Man, Daniel Johnston, who's uh, ha- who you know has had two now in full documentaries made about him in the time since I started my movie. Um, so, uh, you know, a really eclectic, a huge cast of uh, interviewees and subjects that I talk to, plus uh, um, musicologists and professors from Yale and Juilliard and NYU. Um, so uh, it's been a 12 year project in the making. I shot, uh, you know, probably a thousand hours of footage. I have a rough cut happening now. And uh, the next step is I'm basically raising my finishing funds and sort of plotting out uh, the graphics and animation that go, um, you know, that are going to go in the movie. And, uh, you know, it's a long one. It's a huge one. So I basically had to go off and kind of make a whole movie in between making this thing to even understand how to handle something at such a giant length and all this stuff. And I assume that because of the length, it'll probably end up being cut into pieces in some way. It actually has an intermission, but... Um, you know, if it was ever to get on some sort of TV presentation, I'm sure it would have to be formatted or cut into pieces or something like that. But uh, it's a huge undertaking. It's an epic. Uh, it's it's as epic in scope as it is in length and uh, and all that. So I'm really proud of it. I'm really excited. Um, you know, Pete is obviously a little bit of a part of it because he's a musician as well. So he'll have kind of a you know he'll work on it in a technical sense, and also he's he's in there a little bit. So I'm really excited about that. And then also too, I think I mentioned before, but I have. Uh, I have an assistant um, that I work with on Hack to Knife and on my, I, I, to make a living, I basically just uh, do video work locally and I just have clients um, around Michigan and uh, everything from engineering firms, school districts, uh, you know, municipalities, places, things like that. So I have, uh, you know, a filmmaking assistant sort of all around. He does cutting for me, but he also um, is, uh, you know, right now as I speak, uh, working on Hack to Knife and he does a thing. Um, called Movies to Watch on a Rainy Afternoon, and that's his YouTube uh, review show. He's almost at 100 episodes, and there's one about Hectic Knife, so you can maybe link to that just to give him a little plug and say hello, Addison. Is it Addison Binnick? Yeah. He just said hi. I don't know if you can hear him. (laughs) I'll put a link in the description below. What was it called? What was it called one more time? It's Movies to Watch on a Rainy Afternoon, and there and if you search for that and then put Hectic Knife after that on YouTube, it'll come. It should come up like first. All right, cool. Thank you. Uh, so to wrap things up, um, where can the good people find you uh, and your movie uh, Hectic Knife? Yes. Uh, well, first, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. And um, you know, I'm I'm on. Uh, I I personally have a Twitter, but I don't really use it. But I use my Facebook all the time. You can find I'm you know Greg just my name Greg Deliso. Search for me right there. I'm, I should come up on Facebook. Um, I have you know Monrovia Pictures, which is the production company that is mine. Uh, that like you know is the one that we basically did hectic knife underneath. Uh, that's we have our YouTube channel and a website. Of course, you can go to the Hectic Knife uh, website, which is just hecticknife.com. And then, of course, Hectic Knife is very active on um, Twitter and very active. And I think that's actually how we found each other, which is on Twitter. So Hectic Knife is very active on Twitter, and you can see it's really cool. We get to meet cool people like you and uh, do stuff like that. So um, we're active on Twitter. We're active on Facebook, um, and obviously Hectic Knife. You know, I, I know this is super techy, but we're on. IMDb, we're on Rotten Tomatoes, um, we're even on Letterboxd, and um, for a little movie like us, you know, we have 52 votes on um, IMDb, and that's that's a ton for a little budding, you know, cult movie, and I can't stress enough, you know, if you, if you see the movie, give it some love on there, and of course, the most importantly, where you can actually see the movie, well, it's on Amazon Prime, so if you have, have Amazon Prime, you can see it there. Um, it, the Blu-ray is coming out, uh, it is available for pre-order now, so you can pre-order the pre-order the blu-ray right now for just 16 bucks on amazon and um it's a be, be available on january 9th and then uh, there's a limited edition vhs release that's coming out on january 16th and that's actually really cool i uh was able to track down 100 blank vhs tapes and i have put some fun trailers before the movie then you got the movie and then you have some exclusive features after that are only on the tape there's only a hundred copies. They're hand numbered by me and each one is signed by me and Pete. It's got original artwork and it's got uh, um, original artwork and, uh, and the artwork on the tape itself on the sticker on the tape and the spine. I did, I drew on it like myself. So I wrote hectic knife and I did that stuff. So it's, so each tape is its own collector's item. They're 25 bucks, but they're, they're a collector's item. If you have a VCR, 
the, it's probably the best presentation to see the movie because it's four three it's black and white so it should look really cool on vhs and be great so that's coming and then um you know it's also on troma now which uh i have to definitely plug that and that's a great thing troma has their own streaming service so for only 4.99 a month you can go to troma now and you get access to literally hundreds of movies and shorts and documentaries Basically, almost all of Troma's back catalog is available. So it's Troma now, and that's the that's a this really cool thing. So Heck Knife is on there. Um, Addison Binnick's work is on there as well. Uh, so you can check that out. He has movies to watch on Rainy Afternoon on Troma now. He did one for BC Butcher and for Heck and Knife, and I think he's done a couple more. Um, so you can check those out. And uh, it's also on limited edition DVD, but we only have about 300 of those left. But you can always get in touch with me. Uh, if you want one, but, um, yeah, we we're on everything, man. We're on Blu-ray VHS, DVD streaming. It's even been pirated. If you do your pirate thing, <laughs> uh, I noticed like if you, you search for it on YouTube and stuff, it's like, there's all those whack ass links that are like, you know, like go here for hectic and it's the like locker or something. Yeah. It's all the torrent, like whatever stuff. So it's on there. So do what you got to do, pirate it, pay trauma, do whatever, but it's available, uh, mostly anywhere. So you can check it out. Awesome. Thanks, Greg, for being on the show, and um, and thank you for and, and and thank you for being on. And I hope you have a wonderful holiday season as we enter the craziest uh, couple of weeks of the year. Yeah, man. Hey, you too. Thank you so much. I really I can't appreciate it enough uh, on our level for us to be able to go on Twitter and, and find cool shows like this to be on. It's it's uh, it's an honor. I can't thank you enough, and I thank you for watching. And uh, we really, Peter and I both appreciate you like so much, and I really it's it's so cool. Um, so thank you all so much. Thanks for having me and um, peace out. All right. Thanks, Greg DeLisa, for coming on the show. Thank you, listeners, for listening to that interview. And please check out Hectic Knife on Amazon Prime and Drama Now. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. You can find me at Movie Kale, and you can also follow this podcast at The Youth Critic, and you can also follow the channel to distribute this podcast and interviews and whatnot at KGD Network. Thanks, everyone, for listening. We will be back with you for the, K- the Hectic Knife review very shortly and a bunch more content. Thank you.